Okay, now we're going to talk about <coughs> Chapter 45, the Endocrine System. This is the uh, body system that makes use of your <coughs> endocrine glands and the hormones to carry out different functions around the body, uh, these chemical messengers uh, that largely take make use of your <coughs> circulatory system to get the message around. Um, now, as we say here, these things go throughout your body, particularly when they involve the circulatory system, but only, only certain cells respond. Um, so with endocrine signaling, the typical way we think about this is, again is it's compounds, hormones released into the bloodstream. They then get out into the body, body fluids around the bloodstream through the capillaries and the cells that have the proper membrane uh, proteins will receive that signal and elicit some kind of response. Um, when you have direct signaling from one cell to an adjacent cell, this is known as paracrine signaling, and um, sometimes you have autocrine signaling when a cell essentially signals itself. <coughs> now, sort of a variation on the paracrine is what we would call synaptic signaling, and that's where um, neurotransmitters are released from a neuron to an adjacent neuron or some kind of cell that then elicits a response. And we have neuroendocrine signaling um, where up in your brain in the hypothalamus there's this connection between your nervous system and the hormonal system and there are <coughs> compounds released by these neurosecretory cells that then uh, cause a response in um, particularly in your pituitary. <clears throat> so that's neuroendocrine signaling. So these are the endocrine glands. We'll, we're going to talk about each of these a little bit. Um, so you probably want to know just a little bit about each of them. So um, of course the hypothalamus, I've mentioned that, at the base of the brain, connected to the pituitary gland. Um, now some of your others also have, while these organs themselves are not endocrine glands, they do have some cells that have endocrine function. <coughs> okay, so um, the endocrine system and these hormones, uh, what they do is in their target cells, they elicit a signal transduction pathway, something we talked about a long time ago. So we talked about these ligands, these molecules that are these signals that are received either by membrane proteins or some other kind of protein inside the cell. And so these hormones sent by the endocrine system are typically the compounds that elicit many of these signal transduction pathways to carry out some kind of function inside the cell. Now this slide is to show us that a particular hormone, here in this case epinephrine, <coughs> can have can elicit different responses depending on which cell is receiving it. So this is one that restricts blood flow to the intestines but speeds up blood flow to the skeletal muscles by dilating those um, arteries. And also you can see in the liver cell it elicits the response of breaking down glycogen into glucose making more food available so epinephrine is something that basically speeds up your metabolism gets you ready to do things gets you ready for action and in this case less of a concern is what's going on in the intestines at this particular moment in time being ready for action is the most important thing that this hormone is getting you ready for feedback is a big deal with the hormonal system. Um, again, these signals um, elicit some kind of response and that response can often have a negative feedback on the pathway. That is, once you get the response going, you can essentially slow down or stop the production of this hormone and what it's attempting to carry out. <coughs> now that's what we call negative feedback. Now positive feedback is where the stimulus elicits some kind of response by your neurosecretary cells and your hormone or your glands and it carries out some response which has a positive feedback which causes more of this to happen, greater stimulus, more of this, uh, in this case, milk to be released and produced. Um, so you can have both negative and positive feedback in these systems. Here's a good example of negative feedback and so it involves blood sugar levels 
and so your pancreas is involved here. You have some cells in your pancreas um, that release insulin, and insulin um, um, stimulates the body, the liver and body cells to take up sugar and store it. And so if your blood sugar levels are um, <clears throat> basically um, too high, you will store it. Whereas if your blood sugar levels are too low, you will your your pancreas releases glucagon, which is a compound that causes the liver to break down sugar and release it. And so again, using these two different compounds, insulin and glucagon, both produced by the pancreas, to attempt to maintain homeostatic levels of your blood sugars, not letting them get either too high or too low. So the hypothalamus is the part of your brain that is the connection with the hormonal system, with the endocrine system, and you, again, you have these neurosecretory cells, and so they receive some type of nervous impulse, and they then release compounds <coughs> that, in this picture, are acting upon the posterior pituitary, and depending on which of those compounds is being released, you can the posterior is responsible for ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and oxytocin, and you can see the functions they have, they have ADH acts upon the kidneys and oxytocin, uh, the, the, the mammary glands and the uterus. But you also have some neurosecretary cells that act upon the anterior po uh, pituitary. And you can see many different functions going on here um, in the anterior pituitary, including a lot of uh, what we call these tropic hormones, like FSH, LH, um, TSH and ACTH, these first four here. Tropic hormones you see are hormones that act upon other glands as opposed to these non-tropic hormones which simply travel to, around and the relevant tissues respond to them and do something. But these tropic hormones cause these other glands to then often release other kinds of hormones. So here's our exhaustive list and um, you should know a bit about each of these glands. Um, you don't have to know, well, for example, of course, the anterior pituitary has a lot going on. So you should probably just remember one or two of those, I would suggest. Um, some of them, it's pretty pretty straightforward. They don't have a whole lot going on. Parathyroid hormone involved with maintaining calcium levels um, in your blood, for example. And there we just talked about the pancreas again with the hormones that they release that control blood sugar levels. Your adrenal glands, we've talked about epinephrine already, again helping to get you ready for action. The gonads, testes in male and ovaries in females, um, these are glands that release um, steroid hormones, androgens primarily in the case of the testes, the testosterone being the primary one. Um, you can see they're regulate, regulated by these tropic hormones from the uh, anterior pituitary. The ovaries producing estrogens, again, uh, important in the female cycle and pregnancy. Pineal gland, uh, melatonin. This is one that we use to essentially tell light from dark, day from night. It's how we keep our biological clock. <coughs> All right, again, there are those tropic hormones that we get released from the anterior pituitary. And again, they act upon other endocrine tissues, causing them to release hormones or carry out some kind of response. Again, the non-tropic just are released and cause some cell to do something. Here are examples of some of the non-tropic. And so, for example, with the parathyroid gland, so it releases parathyroid hormone, which um, if you're low on blood calcium, it stimulates the um, release of some calcium from your bones, and also um, stimulates the kidneys to retain more of the calcium from the, that's flowing through your system and from the foods you eat, and get it flowing back out through the blood system. Um, so a good example of a non-tropic hormone that's involved with homeostasis. All right, so um, stress. So we talked about how um, your adrenal glands produce epinephrine and norepinephrine, and this is stimulated by the ad adrenocorticotropic hormone, one of these tropic hormones. 
And on this side, so that hormone is acting upon the adrenal glands. And so it's causing the release of these compounds. And this is what happens with sort of long-term stress. You're just constantly releasing these compounds that act upon your adrenal glands that cause the release of these compounds. And so you can see um, these are reactions that are not necessarily a good thing to be happening all the time. And this long-term stress can lead to problems. Now in the short term, it's more of our nervous system that is responding also to this stress. And so this is a relatively quick reaction. Again, the releasing of epinephrine and norepinephrine. And again, these are getting you ready for action. Um, <clears throat> in the lack of some immediate problem, this side of the system generally shuts down, but chronic stress can keep this side, the right side of the system operating, which again can have <clears throat> negative impacts on, on one's health. Increased blood volume and blood pressure, you know, constant high blood pressure, not a good thing. All right, so we already talked a little bit about the gonads, uh, the testes, and the ovaries. Can um, well, both males and females have all of these hormones, but because males have testes and the testes produce a lot of androgens, the males tend to have more of the androgens, and the females tend to have more of the estrogens and progesterones, and that's a hormonal signal differentiating the, the genders from each other. Um, and again, testes primarily produce the androgens, testosterone being the main one. Um, maintaining male reproductive system <coughs> responsible for secondary male second, secondary sex characteristics like more muscle mass, deeper body, deeper voice, uh, hairier bodies. Um, when you take supplements of these, that is artificial androgens to help build up muscle mass, or basically taking steroids, as we say, this um, getting these high doses is not something our bodies are really accustomed to. And so while it can increase muscle mass, it can also carry some side effects that aren't so good. Again, estrogens from the female, uh, from, the, from the ovaries, um, involved with the female cycle and getting ready for and maintaining the uterus during pregnancy. Uh, important jobs there. Everyone, every male, a uh, mammal that is, I should say, starts out embryonically as a female, but in, with the presence of the Y chromosome, um, those undifferentiated parts develop into male parts because of the higher levels of the androgens. And in this experiment, what they did in these embryonic rabbits, they removed the gonads, the embryonic gonads, in which case those individuals, even who were XY individuals, developed as females because they lacked those testes and they lacked those high levels of androgens that caused them to become a male. So sort of female is the default pattern for mammals and only when you have that Y chromosome and all that testosterone do you develop into a male. Okay, we'll get to this in the next video.